class for you this morning. So, guys, I'm excited for the message this morning. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Dave. Um, give me a second to get set up here. How about some kudos for the worship team? Uh, I think Nello is doing an incredible job uh, leading there and, and just really, how's this work, Dave? It, you push down? How do I get it down? There we go. You gotta have strength. Brother. Yeah. That's almost all my weight. Or, or, or you raise the seat, maybe? No, that's just All right, all right. Sorry for the thing. Um, well, good morning, Renovate. It's good to see you guys. Uh, I'm excited about being here. Um, I have a message that is, you know, very meaningful to me, hopefully will be to you. I know if you're going to walk with the Lord for a long time, um, this is a key subject. I want to welcome you, those of you who are online uh, watching us by the streaming. I know Jim and Becky are there and want to say hi to them. Uh, so this morning is, the, our, is the second part of our series on walking with God. Last week, as you know, Pastor Dave uh, talked about if you want to walk with God, then you need to be available. And availability is making your time and your attention, you know, open to God's using. But today I want to talk to you about abiding with, with and in God. Now, abiding is a verb that means to remain, to, to dwell, to stay in a continued presence. And that's an interesting thing, right, to stay in a continued presence, because that's really who God is, whether you realize it or not, which is what I'm going to talk about. And the question is, is if, if God is, if Jesus is asking you to abide in him, would he do that if he already didn't possess that quality within himself? You know, we believe as Christians, biblically, that God is first in all things. So he doesn't ask us to do things that he actually hasn't already done. Okay? It's a, one of the beautiful things about God. So I believe that the answer is absolutely. He, he is someone who abides. And my life story, I think, reflects that. I think yours does too if you take a look at it and we're fair and honest. Um, so I wanted to start off with kind of a brief um, overview of my life. Um, I believe that it's a God story. Uh, I mean, I totally believe, I know it's a God story. And I can't get into the details of that today. There, there's going to be some things that I'm going to mention, but trust me, the real details and the real fullness of the story, then it absolutely speaks, you know, that, that my life is a total God story, and, and as well as yours. But I thought I would start with an overview of mine, because I believe that God, you know, he's the author of our life, he's the author of our faith, and therefore he desires to be the one who writes the story. And he has a story that he wants to write. And I believe that all of his stories, no matter what they look like in the process, are stories of glory. Okay? Because that's where it ends up. It ends up a story of glory. So, let me take a sip. I took some Sudafed this morning and I'm pretty parched. When I was a little boy, I was raised in church, but I was not raised in a Christian home at all. But we went to church every Sunday. So we would go, and I would go to Sunday school and listen to the Bible stories and listen to the things about Jesus and all that. And, you know, I, I really believed it, and I liked it. I, I bought it. I was probably, you know, somewhere in the ages of five to seven. And I just remember loving Jesus and walking with him. Um, so that was great, but there was nothing in my house that was reinforcing that. Um, there was nothing in, outside of my house that was reinforcing that. The only time I was getting that was on Sunday mornings, and I had the faith of a little child. So I bought it. But as I'm going through life, all that goes away, right? The dysfunctions in the home, the dysfunctions outside of the home, the pressures of the world, the attractions of the world, it all goes away. And by the time I'm 18, 19 years old, um, 
my life was very dark and lost. <clears throat> very dark and lost. And so what happened was is I had a lot of demonic activity going on, significant demonic activity. I was really screwed up. And I had been turning to God because I had this base level faith, whether I was walking with him or not, knew him or not or whatever. You know, every Sunday I'd go to church and he's up there on the cross up front. And I'm like, well, that's who it is. So I'm turning to him over and over. But in my opinion, he's failing me over and over. Okay. And so I get to the point where I believe that God is just, I, you know, I don't want anything to do with him. I said, you're a jo I told him, you're a joke. I don't want anything to do with you. You know, I basically disdained him. And then, but it just got to the point where I couldn't do it anymore. So before I'm 20, I find myself walking out the door to, <clears throat> to kill myself for the second time. I rehearsed this without crying, I want you to know. So, here I am, I'm not even 20, I'm walking out the door to kill myself. And I'm thinking, I, I remember I had to, because you, you have to get to that point, right? What are you processing to get to that point? You're processing that death is your brightest alternative. That's what you're processing. That's how you get there. And so, and so I'm like, yeah, hey, good, we're done. I'm happy to do this. Here we go. I'm walking out the door, God speaks to me. He speaks to me and says, get down on your knees one more time. So, the God who I wasn't walking with, right? Who I, who I said, you're a joke. He's still walking with me. He's still abiding with me. So, what were my options? I, I actually didn't want to do it. I told him, I said, no, you don't understand. I said, you don't understand. I can't do this anymore. I, I am more than glad to die. Death is good to me right now. You, I don't trust you. That's where I was. But you get down to it, you got nothing to lose, right? I got nothing to lose. So I did it. I go back to my bedside. I'm weeping. I'm, I'm begging God to take it away. And he does. Anyway, he takes it all away. It's amazing. It was unbelievable. Next day I wake up, I am a delivered, Jesus-loving fool, right? So, oh, and what I didn't, what I didn't tell you was, I missed this, um, and I'm not trying to make this testimony too long. So, when I was little, when I was like five to seven, in that age when I was walking with Jesus, I had these three dreams. I didn't realize, I didn't, I couldn't figure out those dreams. I just, they stuck with me though, and they were almost identical. And they stuck with me, and my whole life I'm growing up, and I would think about those dreams, and I go, what was that about? I have no idea what that was about. I'll tell you what it was about. It was about that two-year span when my life was just getting wiped out. And the last dream, the third one, was about me coming home to him. And it's, and if I told you the whole testimony, you'd see it clear as a bell. It's amazing. And so I even had these prophetic dreams way back when I was a boy. He's, he gives me these dreams. Um, gives me these dreams. Okay. So let me catch up here. So I began walking with God. And now the true life that he has planned for me can actually begin. And I'm in, man. I don't want to go back to where I came from. Not interested. He's dealing with me well, and I'm loving it. So at 21, he speaks to me, and he tells me he's going to give me a wife. And, and, he's, and at 23, and five weeks before I turn 24, I meet my wife on a blind date. I marry her quickly. I didn't want her to get away. We were married in nine months. I'm not somebody who says, okay, I, you know, I'm like, let's do this thing. So, but God was good to me that way too, right? And and, and so, and living with the Lord is being, it, it's good. Everything's good. My world looks good. Um, but I didn't understand that there still were trials to come. And if you're young, I'm going to tell you, life in Christ is fantastic, but there's trials to come, and it's okay. Because they they're going to be tough, but, but he's with you. 
So in 1990, God speaks to us really clearly. The story's long, it's detailed, it's amazing. He tells us to move to Texas, and so we do. In 1992, we moved to Texas. We get here with fantastic expectations because the story of him getting us here and all the things involved are like, man, God's going to do something in Texas. It's going to be incredible. We're looking forward to it. Turned out, moving to Texas was a crucible for us. We get here, we're, we're, we're struggling, we're okay, you know, we're actually going into a little bit of debt, we're not prospering, we're making it, it's, you know, it's not the worst it could be. And in 1995, I break off with my business partner, who was my best friend at the time, and that changed everything, because all of our friends and everything looked at me like I was an untrustworthy snake, a traitor, people pulled back from me, um, I was on my own in business at that point again, which I was before, but I was again. And man, we just couldn't get work, and it was really hard. And when I would get work, it was just, you know, in, in trying to catch up with the loss that we had. To, it, was, it was very difficult, it was very bad, very hard. And everything that we had was either breaking or being stolen. I had my tools stolen three times in two and a half years, and I make my living with my tools back then, right? Go out there, my van's wiped out, gone, everything. And uh, so it was just really difficult. So our finances are crushed, things aren't good. By 1998, we find ourselves on the brink of divorce. And I'm like, uh, okay, this isn't where I was going with my life. And by the way, God, wasn't, wasn't this the marriage that you put together? Wasn't this, wasn't this you? There was no light to be seen. And I couldn't feel or sense God anywhere. It was like we were cursed. And I'm, you can ask my wife, it was like we were cursed. So, but what are my options, right? What are my options? I pour into God. That's what I do. I'm like, come on, man, I'm hanging on to you because I don't know what's going on, but I know who you have to be. I, I, I believe more in about who God has to be than what anyone would want to espouse about him. This is who you have to be. You have to be faithful. You have to be, you know, a provider. You, there's things you have to be. That's the way I look at it. So he came and he saved our marriage. And today, because of his faithfulness, my family, our family is whole. It's whole. And I can tell you that I'm 35 years smitten to the same woman because God came. Because God abided with us when we couldn't see him or feel him. In in 2002 still being broke right things weren't things weren't much better maybe we were surviving better but we certainly weren't prospering i can tell you in 2002 we're just you know down this long road in this desert and decide to open up a flooring business out of a van because i'm 42 years old and i don't have the money to put on a to put down a deposit on the van because i don't have any money I'm just broke, and I have a mountain of debt that's just getting bigger. So I borrow money, I buy a van, I get flooring samples, I start. By 2005, I've got $5,000 in my business account. I have zero personal savings, and I still have a mountain of debt. And we, we decide to open up a store at the risk of everything, right? At the risk, if this fails, we're done, it's over you know, bury us. <clears throat> so sure enough, we opened up this store. And, and God did it. It was amazing. God did it. But still, we had to make it, right? Okay, cool, we're open. And you did so many things to get us here, but still, we had to make it. We get halfway into that first year, man. Business dried up completely dead, zero sales. And, and we're dying on the vine. And, and, and I went home, and I told her, I said, two more weeks. That's it. Two more weeks. If that doesn't happen, that's it. I'm sorry, I'm so emotional. <clears throat> There's a reason. I think I figured out why I'm so emotional, actually. I'll share that at another time, I suppose. But here's the deal. I go home. I'm desperate. I tell God, hey, look, I gave my best shot. This is your thing. Hand it over to him. Say, I'm done next day sales come in every single day every single day sales came in boom 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 
We made it. We made it. Here's what I know. I'm sorry, I got a pop-up going on here on my screen. Here's what I know. Every good thing I possess, materially, spiritually, relationally, I don't care phys physically, I don't care what it is, it comes from God. And I'm going to tell you, today's message is about believing in him more and going, trusting him more that you desire to go deeper with him because he's walking with you. Whether you see it or not, God is walking with, through, with you every day, all the time, and he has for your entire life. That's a fact, okay? That's who he has to be again, right? That's who he has to be. And then walking with God, this is hopefully what you'll get out of the series, that walking with God is where heaven meets earth, right? It's where it collides, man. This is where it's at. This is where God is real in us, okay? Not real out there, yeah, I believe. No, real in us. That's where it is. This is where true life happens. This is where you get it. This is where you experience the treasures of God when you're abiding with him and him with you because you can't get that stuff anywhere else. You're not going to get it in the world. You can only get it when you're walking with him. Walking with God is our spiritual home. It's our destiny. It's what we were made for. That's the message in the nutshell if you want me to stop right there. Keep going. I know. It was a joke. So, as true as that is, that walking with God is our destiny and spiritual home, we, we find ourselves so often not really pursuing it. And I think it's because, you know, I've just thought about it. I'm like, you know, it's a little intimidating. Uh, you know, if I go into God, what's he going to ask of me? I mean, it's, 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 a little, it's a little intimidating. It's a little fearful. So we just sort of don't press in and we press into other things, which God's not opposed to us pressing into other things as long as it doesn't take his place. That's all. It's not a big deal. And so what I'm hoping to do is, is talk about these things in such a way that you decide, you know what, I'm not afraid, and I am going to press in. I am going to go deeper. Because I think you'll be surprised to find out that God doesn't look at spiritual, uh, that, yeah, at spiritual intimacy with him as much more than, because you have to understand, you, he, he fully understands our frailties and our human frame. Okay? That's not a mystery to him. It's baked into the equation. Have you ever heard it's baked into the stock price? It's the same thing. He already knew that when he went into this. So, so, so my point is, is I think that he looks at spiritual intimacy with him and he looks at it like, I just want an open, loving, trusting relationship, a committed relationship that's open and honest. Just give me that open, honest, and trusting. That's what I'm looking for. I can deal with the rest. I know the world's tough. I know you see things in part, right? I know you see things in part. I see it in whole. You don't. Just, just walk with me. Let's just do this. And as you know, relationships, right, um, they have to be two-way. They have to be two-way. Both speaking, both listening, both trusting and believing in each other. And I've said that on purpose. God, he, he, know, he knows who you can be in him, and he trusts you, and he believes in you, and he wants the best for you. And he's got, so he's got his side wrapped up. It's about getting our side wrapped up, right? And relationships as well are only as good as the weakest link. So we'll always be the weakest link, but, you know, we can go further. We can improve our side. And it's not work. It's, it's just... It's just getting into his presence, and it's just, it's just saying, hey, here I am. We see that all through the Bible, right, with the great men of the Bible. Habakkuk that Pastor Davis talked about, King David, right, who is the most famous man called the man after God's own heart, right? These guys were honest. They were getting crushed, and they said, they, 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 they wept, and they said, we're being crushed, and where are you, God? And it, it never mattered whether they were on the hilltop or in the valley or in the, or in the mundane. They were honest with God, and that's what God wants because he knows what's going on, and he knows what the future is too. You can be on the mountain. He knows the valley's coming. You, you can be in the valley. He knows the mountaintop's coming. Listen, he's just like, I just want to be with you. Will you just be with me? I want to go through all this with, me, with you. Trust me, it'll be better if I do. Because intimacy with God is just a total embrace of him, God the person. That's what it is. 
doesn't matter the conditions or circumstances. He just wants to be our life's center all the time. But in contrast to that, right, we walk out this earthly life, even as believers, and sometimes we just don't see or sense the presence of God. And I mean, I don't care who you are, you've been through that. And sometimes more than, than you would have hoped for, you just don't see or feel it. And, and you know, we, we can fall into this place where we, we have this, this perception that we're kind of separated from God, even if we're believers. It's, like, it's kind of like, I just really feel like I'm here and he's out there somewhere and, and we're just not connected and, you know, I, I just don't see him or, 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 or feel him anymore. And, and, you know, we struggle with that, right? That inward awareness and that assuredness of his presence in our life. Well, what I'd like to do is kind of hopefully dispel that so that if that starts to come on you again at another point in time, that you can go to the truth of what you understand about him and throw that out. Because sometimes we buy into it. We end up stuck there for a while. Well, one of God's most famous attributes is that he is omnipresent. And omnipresence, omnipresent means all present. It means that God has the ability to be in all places at the same time, that his divine presence in all of its glory and power is able to be in the whole of the universe at the same time. And it means that there is no space or place, and I need you to remember that, there is no space or place that he does not inhabit. Okay? So he's here, he's here right now. And I don't care where you are, he's there. Psalms 139.8, King David said, If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. And this is interesting, right? Because Sheol, hell, heaven, these are two different places, and he's in both places. In heaven, his glory is clear. His glory is consuming. His presence is, is, is you know, it's amazing. In Sheol, it's like absent, but it's not absent because the deal is, is that he's there because Sheol can't exist without him, right? And why can't it actually even exist without him? Not that he made it. Why can't it not even operate without him? Because the Bible tells us that he holds all things together, right? Uh, Colossians 1.17, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. Things only are because he is. Whether you see him or not, feel him or not, he's, he's doing this. Which is an interesting point. This is the point that I hope kind of breaks that I'm here, you know, he's there thing. His omnipresence is active in power in, in, in holding everything together, in allowing everything to activate and be, okay? Science says, oh, there's energy in all of us, there's energy in everything, and it's going back and forth and transferring and all that, and that's true. That's absolutely true, right? But they can't identify where energy comes from. They understand the dynamics, the movements, the principles. That's great. They can run their calculations. I'm all about science. But they stop at a certain point, and they can't tell you where it comes from. And what the Bible's telling us is that he... And that he is Jesus, specifically, if you look at it in a scriptural context, that he is holding all things together. He is the one who is empowering your existence at all points in time. That's why, you know, if, if, if you don't sense him, just know he's here. I'm only here because he's here, right? I only exist and have my existence and my being because he's here. And the thing is that's interesting is that it brings this other thing into play, which, you know, can get a little spooky. I don't want you to think I'm getting Eastern, but here's the deal. If you're a believer, he lives in you by the Holy Spirit. If you're not a believer, he's still all through you. He's still empowering your existence at all points in time. Something is. And I'm believing it's not a something, and I'm believing it's not an abstract, whatever, mathematical, you know, impossibility equation, et cetera, et cetera. I'm believing that's a, that it is a Lord God who loves you, and this is a plan. That's what I believe. And so he's holding you all together at all points in time. Your bodily functions, phys physiologically, or any other part of your existence is happening because he's making it happen. So he's all through you, 
but yet, according to what we understand in Scripture, he's still not in you because there's a place that's been made by him reserved for that. And, and, and that's what I'm going to get into next, right? Um, he formed you in your mo mother's womb, right? I mean, this is the idea that he's in you, all through you, or not in you, but that he can be all through you, but yet actually not really in you. David says, hey, he formed me in my womb, wove me together. The miracle of life is constantly being upheld by his power. All right. So, it's like he encompasses you completely at all points in time and he's pressed up against you all right and he's pressed up against you because he's waiting for you to let him in he has true life and he's waiting for you to let him in because he can transform you and turn you into a, a you know the, the the true life or give you the true life that he desires for you if you've never really thought about it before, because there's a lot of stuff that goes out there in the world, and in the church, if we're not totally set on what we believe, we find ourselves drifting over into worldly thought. If you've never really thought about it before, consider this, that life is actually ultimately spiritual, okay? Because there was nothing, and then everything that was created but was, was created by the Spirit of God. In, in, in the act of creation. So everything that was natural is that everything that is natural actually came out of the spiritual, the spiritual and the supernatural, which was God. And therefore everything that is is in is in direct responsibility, has a direct responsible relationship to its maker, right? Whether you recognize it or not, you're not, you, you didn't have a thing to do with your existence and neither did anybody before you and it keeps going on down the line and then you get to the place, well, somebody had to do this, right? Somebody has to be responsible and whoever that person is, I'm responsible to them. So the easy deception, though, in life is that it's all physical, it's mechanical. This is the kind of stuff you're getting out of the scientific community, which I'm not opposed to science at all. Science is wonderful, but they, but they stop it short of where the true life is, right? They stop it short of the real answers. It's all fun. Do, well, let's do lab tests, experiment, find things out. It's all fascinating. I like it too. But man, I, I, I need something bigger. I need to know the why that I'm here, right? I need to know the how and the why of why I'm here. And, and that's where you're going to find your true life. So everything in creation now is meant to be relational we are meant to be relational right and we're meant to be relational first to god right and then to others and everything else around us but why is that so significant here's the thing that i want you to understand i i, I touched on this in my first message and it's concerning the trinity I, and 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 i'm going to touch on it again because if you didn't get it that time i'm hope you're going to get it this time there's many there's many incredible truths that come from the doctrine and understanding of the Trinity that if you don't have them, you're going to be missing some significant parts and understandings in your faith. So, our God is inherently relational. We know that because the truth is, is that prior to creation, he existed in a triune God. And there was a perfect, eternal, loving relationship happening at all points in time prior to creation no other religion in the world states that their god is triune okay here's the thing all the rest in fact what they do is even if they call themselves christian doc you know christian offshoots or whatever they throw out the trinity because when they do that they can change who god is and when they do that they even change on what the motive of creation could have been, okay? Because when you understand it, and I can't go into it, but, but ch it changes the motive of why you created, right? So he's existing, he's inherently relational, all the rest are existing in this solo, non-relational existence. And then they choose to create. Why did you choose to create? Well, because you were lonely? Bored? What was going on? You existed all by yourself, and now you choose to create. Why'd you do that? 
Ours wasn't bored. Ours was fulfilled in a relationship that was loving and eternal and had everything in it, and he didn't need a thing, and he chose to create for different reasons. He is inherently relational. And so you need to understand this. Our God's not like any other. He's alone, not in lonely. He is alone in who he is. That's, that's how he's alone. Without that understanding, maybe you wouldn't want to go to him and, and, and pursue him. I would get that. I get that. But not this God. Not this one. This is the one you want to pursue. So, <clears throat> we being the pinnacle and glory of his creation... We're created for intimate relationship as well. And like him, if you can buy this idea, we were created in a triune design. He's in a triune. Well, he's not in a triune design. He is triune. He's like, hey, I'm going to make them in a triune design. Makes sense. He likes who he is. You know this scripture. Then God said, let us, referring to the Trinity, Make man in our image, according to our likeness. Our triune design is body, soul, and spirit. Okay? Body's easy. We know what that is. It's our physical being. Um, oh, and look, real quick. The body, the, our triune design, body, soul, and spirit, they are integral to each other. Right? You can't separate them. In this life, you can't separate them. And everything that happens to one happens and affects the other, or happens to the others in some manner. It affects the others, right? It is, they are integral. So, you have your body. We know what that is. But then you have your soul and your spirit, okay? And the soul and the spirit is quite often referred to as, the, as one in the same. Even in Scripture, it's used, you know, in one and the same in, in, many, in many different times. But it is, it, does, it, it is actually distinctively different, and I want you to follow me on this. I want, what I, the way I want you to see soul and spirit is that they're two distinct, but like a marriage, they've come together to be one. They're regarded as one. They're treated as one in a lot of ways. But they actually are distinct, okay? So look at it that way. That should help clear some things up. So the soul... In simple terms, is your mind, will, and emotion. Your mind is your intellect, your ability to assimilate and process information, right? It's your ability to reason. Glad we have it. Thank you, Jesus. Your will is your capacity to determine things, what you'll commit to, what you won't, whether you'll be willful or stubborn or, or, or you know, go on a diet. Chad and I were talking about that. And you're going to need some will. Anyway, mind, will, and then there's your emotions. Now, Webster's has this great definition that I really liked a lot. And so this is what I want to read to you. A conscious mental reaction, such as anger or fear, subjectively experienced, right? Doesn't have to be objective. Doesn't even have to be based on objective things. Subjectively experienced as strong feeling, usually directed toward a specific object and typically, and this is, I really want you to hear this, and typically accompanied by physiological and behavioral changes to the body. So this, written a long time ago, back in the 1800s or 1700s, I don't know when Webster wrote all this stuff. Even back then, he was like, look, man, emotions, they're such a power player. They'll affect your body. They'll affect your mind. There, it's, it's all integral. Who we are, this triune design that God made us to be is integral. And what comes in and affects one affects the rest. And I just love the way that he recognized that in the, in the definition. So, you know, emotions, it's how we experience life, right? Love, hate, grieving, celebration, anxiety, peace. But then there's the spirit, right? The spirit, which I believe is distinct. So Genesis 2, 7, then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And that word breath in Hebrew is, if I'm pronouncing it right, I actually meant to call my Jewish friend and say, hey, make sure I'm doing this right, and I didn't get it done. Neshama, okay, which means both breath and spirit. So by the breath of God, he imparted the spirit of life into our physical beings. 
That's why we're alive. That's God's life-giving part of who we are, and we can't live without it. We don't live without it. And yet at the same time, that spirit life in us is quite often the most forgotten and neglected and empty vessel or part portion of who we are because, because we're living soul-led lives. And yet God meant it to be the most important, or it is the most important part of who we are, right? But yet we, we tend to leave these soul-led lives, right? Whatever our mind, will, emotions, whatever our body desires, um, all these things, they come into play and, and we're not really walking with God in our spirit and listening to him and saying, you know, I shouldn't, I shouldn't. You know, because the other thing too about God is a lot of times he's going to say, yeah, do it, go for it. That'll be, that'll be great. He's, 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 not a, he's not a joy stealer. He's not, a, trust me. I mean, but the point is, is we lead these soul-led lives. And, and the problem with a soul-led life is that, is that your mind can be deceived by some lies, right? And you begin thinking irrationally. You're getting all whacked out in the way that you're thinking. You're, you're, you can have damaged emotions that are starting to corrupt your perspective and, and change your choices and cause you to do things and, and acerbate, as, increase your problems, um, you know, and, and you end up with a life that's in distress and chaos. And then all that's on you, and, and your body chemistry actually begins to change. You know, I mean, you, you go into a panic attack, and, 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 and your body chemistry goes like this, and it, it causes all kinds of problems. And it's not that you can't have problems. Look, when I came up here today, when I was first started, I was really nervous. Praise God, he's gotten me through that. But I'm just saying, it's not like you don't ever, you're never afraid or you're, you never have a, a, a moment of anxiety or whatever. But I can tell you this, when, when you're spirit-led and you're communing with your heavenly father through Christ Jesus in, in the spirit that he gave you, it does overall just work in you with you for a better life and then when you have those pop-up times man you know where to go you know where to go because you know the peace you've been living in and you know the truth that that's what he wants for you and has for you and 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 you go deeper with him at those times and and he's a good god he comes but we in our natural man we don't give our spirit any attention right we don't Here's the thing. Look at it this way, too. We'll go back to the Trinity. In the Trinity, we understand that the Father is the head of the Trinity. Jesus and the Holy Spirit, equal in being God. They are equally God. Willingly submitted themselves to the headship and the leadership of the Father. In our triune makeup, if you can accept that idea, body, soul, and spirit, my question is, which one do you think God is? intended to be the head of who we are the body i don't think so the soul nope i think he created the spirit he created it for him to dwell in and for us to abide and dwell with him in and he said you know what you give me that and i'll give you leadership and and, and i'll give you leadership and fulfillment and all the things you need in the body and soul he goes that's the head don't be led by the other things. That's the head. Let's stay there. So, intimacy with God then is living with him in our spirit by his Holy Spirit so that the benefits and fruits, the benefits and fruits of true life in him and the leadership of his Holy Spirit can come in and give us all that we need uh, in the rest of our life. I have some scriptures here. Romans 8, 5, 14. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Verse 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who... who he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead, listen to this, will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And that's a life to come, 
and, but it's also a life now, right? It's also a life now. It's both. 14, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. 2 Corinthians 3, and I love this one. It's so good. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and the, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Right? You want to be free? Let the Lord come in. Here's what God says. He's telling us that he brings life, liberty, and peace to those of us who walk with him. Right? Then there's also, you know, his high priestly prayer. So these are just backup scriptures. If you want to call anything in scripture, backup. How about, how about, you know, primary? Thank you. John 17, 22. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one just as we are one. I think that glory that he's talking about is the love from his father. And he's like, man, the glory of that love, the glory of your love in me, I turned around and I gave it to them. Okay, that's what he's talking about. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. He wants us to know that in the same manner that the Father loves the Son, which is to an infinite depth, that the Father loves us. And He's there to make that happen. That's what He's doing. So that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. And so what you see is you have this incredible love from the Father, right? And the Son. And how many times did He say, you in me, me in them, I in you, you in me. This is, this, this, is, this is what he wants to do. This is what you were made for. And it changes you, right? He did it so that the power of his love for you and in you can actually go so deep, be planted so deep that it actually changes who you are. Okay? He did it so that you can have this new life that finds itself completed in him, having become, as the word tells us, a new creation. Born again. Have you heard that one? I know you have. So that you become this new person. And that and that, that love in you actually gives you then the ability to return a love to God that he desires to have and to give a love to your neighbor that they desire to have in such a way that it's a powerful witness and it actually becomes your new natural, right? It becomes your new natural to love God that way, to actually love your neighbor. And I know we go up and down in that when I do. I look at something and I, and I have not good things to say. But man, my backdrop is, my foundation is, when I don't get off of it, when I don't get off my foundation, I know that I actually do love my neighbor. And, and, I try, and I work to overcome the things that come in to get me off that foundation, right? So, I'm going to read this last scripture and, and, and uh, end with an illustration, sort of. Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him, and he will dine with me, and, and I will dine with him, and he with me. So, uh, this is what I want you to picture. Your, your spirit, your heart, which is also uh, the same thing in many references, is a house. And Jesus is knocking on the door of that house. Okay, He has been your whole life, whether you realize it or not. If you don't know him, I'm telling you, he's been knocking. And I want you to, I want you to just look at it this way. He's, he's there at the door, and he's knocking. And he waits, and he puts his ear up against the door, and he listens, and he knocks, and he puts his ear up against the door again, and he listens, and he knocks, and he calls out by name, hey, beloved, Johnny, Sally, are you there? And he knocks again, right? He's been knocking your whole life, and he's been listening, and he's been waiting. That's what he's been doing. Some of you, if you have not opened that door today, that's what you need to do. That's what you need to do. You need to open that door to him today. But some of you have opened the door. And I'm, trust me, I don't have anybody in mind, so, so just you know, know that's true. He was talking to me. 
but some of you may have let him in and he's just standing in the foyer. I don't know if you noticed, but I'm in the flooring business, and any time I go into an older home, what happens is, is you would go into that, you would come through the front door, and interestingly enough, there would be this isolated area of tile normally, right, in the front door. And it's, it's a designated area, six by six, eight by eight, whatever. And then there's all the floor that goes to the rest of your house. And when you would have somebody come and knock on your door, they would come in, and maybe you didn't know them that well, or however it was, and you'd, they would stand in the foyer, and you would talk with them. And it gave you a level of comfort. Ah, they're not really in my house. They're right there in the foyer, right? Designated by that little area right there in the towel. But the thing is, is they got the same sense. They didn't really sense that they were really in your house either, right? Because they were on this little island of tile. And you kept them there. And they, didn't, and they were like, yeah, I've been in their house, but I, I didn't really see it. I don't really know it, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, maybe that's what some of you have been doing with Jesus, right? You got him right there. When I used to sell floors, I would go into these houses and I would see that. And they would say, oh, yeah, hey, listen, the floor, for your tile's still good. We're going to leave it. It's, you know, it's no reason to change that. And I go, nope, actually not. I said, I said you want to take out this, this foyer uh, flooring material? And you want to run the same floor from the front door all the way to the back. And I said, and here's why. Because when someone comes into your house, even if they don't actually go into your house, they have the sense that they're in your house. They have the visual depth, right? They have, that visual, they have that visual fluidity and that visual depth, and they have this sense that they're in your house. At least give them that, right? And plus, it looks better. And I wasn't doing it for profit, I promise. But, but that's what I would tell them, right? And that's what Jesus wants to do. See, Jesus understands that there are levels, of, there are levels to the reception of, there are levels to the, to the reception that we have for him. Some of them, we haven't opened the door at all. Some of us, we've got them on the foyer towel. Some of us, we have them in much deeper ways. But that's what, that's what he's saying, right? He just said in the scripture, I will come in and dine with them, right? I will go all the way in. What would a guest feel like if you, if, if you came in and, 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 they, and you said, hey, come on into my dining room, my kitchen. Let me get you something to eat or drink and let's talk for a little while. Man. What would that mean to them, right? What if you said, hey, come on in. You know, I'm not doing anything this evening. Let's sit in the family room and let's talk and get to know each other and talk about all kinds of stuff. I mean, I, I don't know you that well and I'd love to, right? Well, how, how would they feel? Well, they would feel great. Jesus, who has everything that you need in life and want in life, he's saying, let me do that for you. Man, I... I I, I, can, I can not only have a lot of fun with you, I can, I can impart things to you. Trust me, if you'll allow me to come deeper, things, things, will, be, things will be wonderful, right? They'll be, they'll be good. You'll be changed. And you just need to remember, I, I, like to, I like to always remind myself of who God is, right? Who is this God that's saying, hey, let me come deeper. Let me go in deeper. Will you do that? Who is that? You know, because we get running in life and we forget how incredible God is. And I just want to say a few things about that. First of all, you've heard this, he's the lover of your soul. He's the creator of your soul and he's the lover of your soul. And whether you know it or not, he wants to pour more of it into you all the time. Right? That's what he does. And he's the most compassionate, forgiving, understanding God that you could ever imagine. You, this is the other thing. You can't design a God better than, than our God, okay? This is the one who, when they spit on him and mocked him and whipped him and scourged him and said everything and accused him of things that weren't true, and everybody left him, and they, and they nailed him to the cross, and they hung him up there, and then they still mocked him as if they hadn't done enough, and they still mocked him when it was all done, in the end, he looks up to heaven. And he says, Father, forgive them. Because they know not what they do. They don't know. They don't know you. I know you. They don't know you. They don't know why you sent me. They don't know me. They don't know the, what, what I would do if they would come to me. 
And I still want you to forgive him. I know, my, I know I'm five seconds from dying, but I, I want you to forgive him. That's the kind of God we're talking about. You think you can screw up and, and, and get out of his graces? I don't think so. I don't think so. He's the great physician. He, does, he desires to heal your wounds, your emotional wounds, right? All that stuff. We all have them. He wants to heal those wounds. He's a jealous protector. He's a faithful provider. He's your justice when you're wronged, and he's your mercy when you need it. And I'm telling you, I've run to him. What I've needed mercy, I've run to him, trust me. I said, oh man, I need it now. He's your victory when you're down, and he's your power when you're powerless. What I'm trying to tell you is that he is in truth and in all ways your absolute fulfillment. He knows it. We just have to get there, and we have to. And we have to just let that, like a wave, push us in. And I need it too, man. I'm preaching to myself. Let me tell you something. But he removed every obstacle just so that he could have that with you. For eternity, for here too. We need it more here. When we get there, it's a cruise, man. We're just in a cruise at that point. But we need it here. And he removed every obstacle so that he could have that with you here. And... I had another illustration that I closed with last time, and, and that's what I'm going to close with this time, just as a reminder, right? If this is God, and you were made in his image, you were made in his image for a reason. And you were made for this. That's what you were made for. Total embracement, intimacy. That's why he made you in his image. It's for this, okay? That's why he did it. All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Father, I pray, Lord, and ask that you would draw us closer, that you would encourage us, Lord, by the sweetness of your spirit to go deeper. Allow us, Lord, to begin to lay things down, to begin to cast out any of the things that allow us not to see you clearly for who you are, the loving and wonderful God of who you are. I pray, Lord, that you would give us peace and security and the assuredness of your abiding presence in our life. And Lord, if there is anyone that doesn't know you today, I pray that you would minister, Lord, to them your love for them and that, and that you would draw them in because uh, the journey with you is, Lord, the only, the only journey worth walking. Everything else has a zero end. It has a zero end. But the journey with you has hope through it all. It has assurance through it all. It has relationship through it all. And it ends in glory every time. In Jesus' name.